for his talk. So let me introduce uh, Professor Nelson Chia from uh, Monash University. Uh, now was the first speaker invited for our workshop. Um, we always like to have a local flavour, obviously. Uh, and when CNS was going to be in Melbourne, well, when you're thinking information theory and you're thinking neuro computational neuroscience in Melbourne, uh, now's the guy you think of first. Uh, so he's here. Now he's in Melbourne, but none of the rest of us are. But uh, maybe, maybe in a couple of years' time, we'll, we'll all be back there, and uh, and uh, and well, we can see you live in that case. But uh, tonight, it's just online. So uh, now, over to you for the talk. Okay, thank you, Joe, for the uh, introduction. Can you hear me? All fine. Yeah, all fine. Okay. Um, so before I start uh, the talk. Um, all these slide talk slides I already uploaded on now uh, a slide share uh, in my uh, account and uh, you can find the link to the slide share from my Twitter account uh, at conscious T lab uh, so uh, if you are interested please go there and then download the slides so uh, the title of the talk today is uh, structure of information to understand the study uh, physical basis of conscious experience um so i wanted to start with uh, acknowledgement uh, to the lab members uh, and uh, especially those uh, people who are uh, highlighted by the single uh, faces over there and uh, acknowledgement for the funders so uh, i understand that the uh, uh, computation neuroscience meeting is not really about consciousness so i just give you a brief uh, overview of the traditional approaches to a neuronal or physical basis of conscious experience. And by conscious experience, what I mean is uh, uh, everything that we experience as opposed to not uh, experiencing like non-conscious experience. And also uh, the level of consciousness wise, uh, we lose consciousness during the deep anesthesia or deep uh, uh, sleep, uh, as opposed to we are now fully awake right now. Maybe not in the European people, um but we'll see so the most uh, representative approach is called a neural correlates of consciousness and rather than uh, trying to explain consciousness uh in every aspect uh it tries to find the uh, neuronal activity that correlates uh with some uh, some aspect of consciousness either it could be a percept or a uh, level of consciousness the other type of approach is a brain-based or cognitive or psychological model-based theories uh, the most prominent one is called the Global Neural Workspace Theory and uh, its model. And uh, also some other uh, theories are abound, like recurrent processing. And these are the ones that are based on the fi empirical finding to construct a sort of black box uh, type theories of how the consciousness works. And then the, another distinct approach is uh, uh, so-called uh, integrated information theory. And these are the theory uh, that tries to um, directly connect the conscious phenomenal, uh, phenomenal experience to mathematical structure. And I'm going to talk about the third one uh, mainly today. But uh, integrated information theory has this particular feature where uh, it starts with an uh, uh, assumption about the identity between the information and the conscious experience. And rather than um, uh, assuming the identity, what I have been advocating uh, over the couple of years is that uh, rather than um, um, starting with assumption, try to uh, establish or search for the isomorphism between the phenomenal structure and the informational structure. And uh, today's talk is going to give a uh, brief overview of uh, how we can uh, start to characterize structure of information or structure of phenomenology and how can we bridge the gap between these two types of the structures and uh, uh, starting from the structure of information uh, recently uh, for this audience uh, maybe there are some mathematicians involved and uh, I allude you to these several papers uh, recent papers talking about uh, information structure in the mathematical sense and what I'm talking about uh, is not going to be as uh, strict as these uh, papers, but um, it is uh, related to these uh, types of information structure concepts without going into the further details. All right, so what kind of information structures uh, can support distinct structure of consciousness? That's a question. 
And uh, obviously, brain is structured to form a hierarchy of causal interactions among the neurons. The left side of the brain is a huge uh, structure, but uh, if you zoom in to one of the um, small patch of cortex, uh, you'll find that uh, each neuron is um, ex uh, exquisitely, you know, uh, uh, delicately connected with other neurons. And the connective, directed connective ma connectivity matrix can be simulated or uh, uh, analytic, uh, anatomically, you know, analyzed like this, as a beautiful paper by uh, Riemann um, showed. So the hypothesis about the structure of the brain is that um, it's definitely should correlate or support the co structure of consciousness. However, uh, most likely that many of the structure, uh, structure or uh, activity-based, uh, uh, brain-based uh, structure itself is uh, in a sense not sufficient to um, explain structure of consciousness. And the reason, is, the main reason is that many of the brain activity or brain structure is nothing to do with conscious experience. The uh, various brain lesions uh, in clinical study have amply showing this, but also um, the fact that um, we lose consciousness during anesthesia or sleep also tells you that having brain itself is not sufficient for consciousness. So um, my approach or uh, integrated information approach is to extract some kind of a substrate independent structure of information to identify as a potential uh, isomorphism with the structure of consciousness. So uh, as I already said, the integrated information theory proposed uh, since uh, 2004 by uh, Giulio Tononi is one of the most promising candidate theories of uh, how the information structure is uh, potentially linked with uh, conscious experience. And I'll go just really briefly about what the IIT is. So IIT is, uh, starts with identifying essential features of any moment of conscious experience. That is true as, uh, as long as we can tell. And uh, it tries to identify existence, information, integration, and uh, composition and exclusion as uh, uh, core features of consciousness. And uh, I, I don't go into the details, but uh, uh, each of these uh, types of the, uh, essential features now uh, can help us to derive physical, uh, what kind of physical substrates can uh, support these properties. And the uh, most uh, recent uh, version of the IIT in 2014 uh, is published in that, uh, uh, that uh, goes into the details of how we derive these uh, postulates or substrate, physical sub uh, substrates. And uh, uh, there are some computational toolbox uh, developed by Mainer, and we gave uh, recently a uh, relatively accessible tutorial on, and uploaded onto the YouTube. So if you are interested in the details of the, how the uh, uh, computation works, uh, please go there. And uh, IAT is sometimes uh, mistaken uh, as a sort of a theory that proposes a single number summarizes conscious experience. But that's not the case. And I try to give you a flavor of what the IIT is like today. So to uh, my approach is to test the prediction from IIT rather than uh, developing IIT per se. And to do that, uh, what we used is a fly model of the brains and its activity. And fly, um, you might not believe it, but uh, uh, it has a brain and uh, it uh, is consisted of um, 100,000 of neurons and its connectivity or connectivity pattern uh, has some kind of um, similarity uh, with the human brains and uh, in, in, in some sense. And it's get uh, anesthetized with the ice fluorine, uh, which is the same anesthesia that you know knocks out you when you have uh, that anesthesia. And we recorded a local field potential throughout the brain with uh, laminar electrodes like this. And then uh, uh, my PhD student, Angus, uh, uh, did the uh, following analysis. So uh, B part of the figure is the uh, experience, uh, explaining how we discretize the LFP signal from uh, recorded from channel A, let's say from the central brain and channel B, uh, let's say in the middle part of the brain. And then uh, discretize it to uh, black and uh, white, one zero, and then constructed a 
transition probability matrix. So uh, the left side um, uh, entry of the um, color-coded matrix represents how the state of A, channel A, 0, 0, like black, black, transits to the next state. So here, in this case, uh, 0, 0 uh, went into 1, 1. And uh, that uh, 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 translates to probability of A equal 1 to be you know, higher than the chance, and the probability of B equal 1 equal to be higher than chance. And this is the probability uh, color coded in here. And uh, if you reconstruct this uh, transition probability matrix from all four possible states to each of this uh, uh, channel A and channel B's future state, you can reconstruct something like this. And then integrated information theory uh, reconstructs how uh, information or causation is uh, a ca causal interaction between these neurons are uh, unfolded by their uh, five you know uh, actions or derived uh, postulates. So to uh, give you an idea, just let's uh, first quantify how much channel A uh, makes a difference to the state of the um, system A and B. So if the state of the channel A is zero off, then the probability uh, and then uh, effect onto the future state of A and B can be summarized as a probability density matrix like this. A, if A is zero, then A, B, according to this uh, transition probability matrix, is more likely to be uh, becoming like zero, zero or zero, one compared to one, zero, one, one. That's what A tells us about future state of A and B. And then now uh, IAT tries to uh, capture the amount of the irreducible influence from A to AB. And how do, does it do that? It tries to cap, um, recompute the probability distribution by cutting the influence of each of these you know, connection into the future. And in this particular case, A to B's connection, if you cut it, then the probability distribution doesn't change much compared to other uh, types of the cuts. And this is the this minimal change is the one that we cannot reduce to other type of interaction or influence. And so in this case, we say that the A to AB's influence into the future is uh, 0.019. Uh, we use the distance measure as called uh, as mover's distance to quantify the effects in, uh, of the into the future from A to AB. And then if you do that uh, uh, repeatedly for, from A to AB, A to A, A to B, then in this particular system with uh, this uh, transition probability matrix, it turns out that the uh, uh, inference from A to A is the largest. And here, largest irreducible inference A to A is uh, defined in terms of uh, IAT's uh, integrated information of A. How to, uh, it, it captures how much uh, mechanism A makes a difference to the system AB, which is irreducible and as a, a core of the influence to the system. Okay. And then if you repeat this procedure, not from uh, uh, A, A to A's future, but A's uh, past as well, it turns out that uh, A's past influences most to the A's current status. And then we take the least amount of the influence, which is actually the cause uh, passed to the current state of the A, 0 0.06. We call it as an uh, influence uh, of the mechanism A. And then we repeat that for B and then uh, also AB as a whole. And then uh, we arrive at these three uh, so-called uh, concepts in uh, uh, IIT. A and B and AB jointly uh, generates this causal influence that cannot be reduced uh, cannot be reduced to anything else. And then now at the system level, uh, we try to capture how much of this A, B, and AB is irreducible. And then to do that, uh, we cut the system's uh, connection from A to B, like here B to A in this case. But we also try A to B or uh, uh, and so on. And then it turned out that in this particular case of the uh, uh, system, 
cutting the uh, connection from B to A unidirectionally makes a uh, little difference to the system. That, that is that the B to A uh, connection doesn't influence compared to A to B uh, connection or A to A connection or B to B connection. And with that, we identify this is a sort of the uh, most reducible version of the system's description of the causal influence. And then compare the original fully connected version versus this uh, minimally disconnected version. And then uh, it arrives, uh, the IIT algorithm arrives at the sum of these uh, difference as the uh, magnitude of the integrated information. Okay, uh, this is a quite you know involved explanation, but uh, with two uh, channels of the data with the empirical uh, transition probability matrix, we can definitely uh, compute this kind of uh, entity. And uh, uh, not only two channels. If you extend this algorithm into four, uh, you know, many more channels, then we can start to identify uh, irreducible uh, inference uh, of uh, not only two channels, right? like here and on the left side of the graph uh, is, uh, you can imagine channel A, B, C, D for the yellow. And then each of the connected uh, green one is a uh, two channel. So the top one is A, B. And then a, a blue one is a, another connected three channels, A, B, C. And then a purple one is the A, B, C, D. And then quantify how much each of the channel contributes to uh, A, B, C, D as a whole, like we did for the two channels. And then as I am stopping here, uh, we overall, when we compute this type of the integrated information structure, um, across uh, flies. And then uh, we find that the wake uh, state of the flies, neuron uh, activation, and also the transition probability matrix tends to generate much bigger kind of a rich structure like this one. And uh, to understand uh, the informativeness of this uh, structure, we use the simple uh, linear uh, support vector machine to quantify how well we can uh, uh, discriminate between anesthetized versus unanesthetized uh, fully you know, awake state of the flies. And we uh, were able to do it uh, above a chance, uh, like 60% uh, percent or you know, uh, sometimes it uh, reaches to 70% or something like that. And each of the component uh, contributes to the, um, the discrimination, but structure as a whole uh, seems to do uh, the job really well. Okay, so that's up to the um, part one. Uh, so the sum, to summarize so far, what I uh, showed you is that uh, structure of information in neural systems can be characterized from observation of the system's dynamics and then computing the transition probability matrix empirically. And then richness of the structure of information according to IAT, integrated information theory is correlated to the level of consciousness in the case of flies, at least uh, wakeful versus anesthetized flies. And uh, IITs, uh, I just wanted to note that the IIT is not the only option to investigate the structure of information, as I alluded to in the beginning, that um, uh, the, uh, there are uh, several mathematical papers uh, uh, trying to define formally uh, what the information structure is, and the manning uh, especially derives the uh, information structure measure uh, uh, using the uh, linking between in, uh, integrated information with the category theory in a very lucid way. Okay, shall I take a question, Sofer? Uh, yeah, good, good point now. I was just about to interrupt with one before you moved on from the summary. If you look down at the questions and answers, you'll be able to see it yourself, but I'll, I'll read it out for the purposes of the recording. Uh, from Charlotte Gould, how is the transition probability matrix different from the probabilistic tables used in formal causal analysis, say causal Bayes nets? Does the same kind of inference apply? Thank you. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not uh, really familiar with the uh, one that you're saying, but uh, Transition probability matrix uh, is uh, probably uh, the most uh, complete way of describing how the system transits from one state to the other. 
And uh, it can include also uh, impossible, uh, highly rare state uh, that occurs in the natural observation. And that could be the major difference from other types of the uh, representation. OK. Yeah. Um, let's leave it there. If Charlotte wants any clarifications, she can add that to the comments, and we can come back to it at the end. OK. So okay, that's, that's the only I... question we've got there at the moment. So feel free to go on. All right. OK, so now move on. So now uh, the second part of the talk is uh, also a bit you know, alien to uh, potentially uh, this audience. But uh, I'm going to talk about the structure of conscious experience. And this is uh, uh, people involved in, the, in this project. So. Um, to begin with, I want to start with showing this picture. I'm not sure whether you can see. Uh, Joe, can you see the contents of the photographs? It's uh, uh, flashed really quickly. Yeah, they're flashing quickly, but I can I can see them. OK, that's great. So if you can see it, uh, uh, like Joe, then you might see a uh, natural scene uh, flashed really briefly and uh, in a uh, you know, uh, without any warning or without any context and so on. However, uh, as uh, one of the axioms in IIT says, our conscious experience seems highly informative and well-structured, composed, uh, so that any moment of a conscious experience seems to tell us a lot about the um, image um, that we experience, even with this in a very brief moment. So uh, the question uh, we want to address in this second part is, is a moment of conscious experience really highly informative? And uh, by informative, what I mean is that can we distinguish many different experiences among all possible experiences? And the secondary, is conscious experience meaningfully structured? And by that, it's a bit difficult question to answer, but uh, uh, I uh, modify the question so that uh, we can address a bit more empirically. So uh, the question is, do people in general describe a moment of experience in a coherent structure or commonly in, in a way? And the second question is uh, first addressed by my student, Tao, using a, a lab testing for 10 people or online testing over 600 uh, people using 400 images uh, uh, and so on. And here, what uh, Cao did was uh, showing the uh, picture, as you saw, briefly to each participant, and then ask them to type in five words like this on, on this you know, display. And then after that, uh, to assign the confidence about how much you saw this uh, image. And uh, as an image set, we used uh, some uh, random uh, uh, natural image database, and we include some of the artificial thing. And uh, pe people are never told about what types of the image is going to be shown, or what kind of uh, uh, like, uh, experience you will be uh, told, uh, you know, uh, having in this experiment. So it's no. Uh, uh, warning about uh, the type of the image, and so you basically can't expect what kind of you know object you will be seeing. Okay, and then this is one of the uh, experimental results. So here we showed this particular picture with, with a much higher, a nicer resolution, and then uh, uh, we showed it only for 67 milliseconds, really briefly or 133 milliseconds or 270 uh, uh, 67 milliseconds. And I want, what we found was that uh, each of these uh, 10 people for each of the group uh, made a report that, you know, uh, about this image really well in general. For example, this uh, 66 uh, milliseconds group already had some people, like uh, seven of them, reporting Eiffel Tower. And then you can see that the Eiffel Tower is actually uh, uh, happened to a lot of people, except for this one. There was some kind of spelling mistake here, which I will come back to you later. And then what we try to do is uh, to use a leave one out uh, like analysis rather than uh, defining what the contents of this image should be. So we let the crowd to describe uh, what the answers of our experience should be. And then what the, uh, I mean by that is that, uh, for example, in the case of the Eiffel Tower, 
seven, uh, 13 out of the 27 people, you know, leaving out one particular subject, also reported seeing Eiffel Tower. But if I do the same analysis for other uh, 400 images, then it turned out that none of the people reported seeing Eiffel Tower. And this translates into the information theoretical jargon now highly selective and also specific uh, information. And uh, using our uh, receiver operating characteristic curve, we computed it as an um, uh, area under the curve of 1.0. Or uh, it roughly translates to information bits of uh, one bit uh, of information. Okay. And then uh, uh, when we did that, and then this particular image, Eiffel Tower image, we found that uh, uh, many uh, words were reported highly selectively, meaning that uh, only for this image, but not others, like Eiffel Tower, Paris Tower, France, and Eiffel, and so on. And then as you go lower, like outdoor, it is uh, uh, reported also in other images. Okay, so it captures intersubjective agreement of the uh, uh, reports. But also that here's the worst example. Uh, here, this it, uh, we just you know, happened to discover this, but the Eiffel Tower with a mistake, uh, misspelling was reported by only one person, but not others. So in this case, Eiffel Tower is not, neither selective nor uh, specific and the IUC of 0.5. Distant or the street scape is also, you know, not uh, specific enough. And uh, as a result of this type of analysis, we found that uh, across 400 images and uh, 670 participants, uh, mean information uh, informativeness per word was 0 0.64, even with a very short duration, 67 milliseconds. And also uh, uh, when we double the duration into 133 milliseconds or 266 milliseconds, it very you know, uh, improved the performance into 0.69. And uh, this was before we uh, removed any kind of bad subjects. So once we start to do that, then uh, uh, it's likely that you know, uh, we will see a uh, much more improvement in terms of the, uh, the quality of the uh, informativeness in uh, reports in this task. And uh, one of the most uh, uh, frequent questions about this task when I present this is that uh, maybe you know there is a lot of correlation between the words. So even if you see uh, Eiffel Tower image, the only thing that you saw was potentially Eiffel Tower, and then France or Paris or something like that is all derived from the Eiffel Tower. And that kind of uh, uh, conjecture would suggest that there will be some kind of cluster of the uh, words that are highly correlated uh, in terms of reported pattern. However, uh, empirically, we found that uh, out of uh, 800,000 uh, uh, com combination of all the words uh, reported by six, uh, 600 uh, participants, we rarely found any kind of correlation, meaningful correlation. It's almost always zero. And this uh, figure uh, shows one minus R square value. So uh, one corresponds to you know, zero correlation and then we are taking the square so that it's easy to see. But uh, both positive and negative correlation was almost negligible in our data set. So that seems to suggest that the participants are generating, uh, well able to generate highly informative reports upon seeing very, uh, the, the natural scene in a very brief uh, manner. Specific and selective reports are possible. And uh, this poses a bit of the uh, question and also problem uh, in terms of the traditional uh, psychology or cognitive science, if, you're, if you know about this type of the literature. So this is an um, experiment uh, um, devised by uh, George Sparring in 1960. He showed uh, in uh, this on the display uh, where we uh, he enlarged each of the letters so that it's visible in any location, and then uh, uh, asked the participants what they saw. And then everybody saw that, uh, everybody pretty much uh, reported that, oh, I saw letters. I saw roughly like 12 letters or something like that. But when they were asked which letter, particular letter they saw, then they were quite bad about that. And the uh, uh, estimation is that four uh, letters are possible to report, but not more. And then by changing the, uh, uh, giving a cue, which uh, particular letter they saw, uh, uh, Sparring found that there are uh, actually AYTS 
was uh, present uh, if uh, they were report, uh, you know, queued uh, about uh, you know Topro afterwards and so on. But still, it's always the case that uh, um, the amount of the number of the information people can report on brief viewing was roughly around forty bits per second. And uh, uh, Noret uh, Randers uh, uh, gave a, a quite an extensive review on the literature in psychology from uh, 50s to 70s, and then finding as uh, 50 to uh, 80s, and then um, concluding that you know people's uh, impression of seeing something is uh, something which is very elusive. Uh, so they, they, it's always like regardless of the uh, Paradigm or modality, it's 40 bits per second. And that seems to be counter to what we found so far. And so uh, we did a couple of uh, further experiments. So here, uh, what Regan, uh, my postdoc did, is to show uh, this type of the image. Uh, now we use the word lists that uh, Cao collected in the last experiment. So here we can now uh, intersubjectively subjectively define uh, words that were typically reported, like in build, building, city, daytime, people, sea, sky, skyline, tree, or water, and those that were never reported about this uh, uh, image, like blue hat, boy, coat, country, horse, uh, jerky, old, uh, stand, sunlight, zoomed in. But note that uh, those absent words are the ones that were present for other images in our data set. So all of these could be potentially present, but for this particular image, it acted as an absent word. And then uh, when we did this uh, experiment, after showing one image really briefly, and then we asked, did you see build? Did you see country? Did you see city? Did you see stand? And so on, 20 questions per trial. Then here's what we found. So the combination of this matrix uh, uh, identified whether the present response is more frequent than the absent uh, uh, response. And we did it uh, with a eight level confidence rating. So we have much more fine uh, information, but I'm uh, simplifying it here. So here, as you can see that most of the uh, words that were reported previously on a completely different subset of subjects were endorsed by these uh, new subjects and almost always you know, uh, consistently, except for the words like people, or tree. Most likely it's because um, the, in the case of a tree, it's likely that you know subjects uh, you know hallucinated uh, seeing people in the original one. Or a tree is actually uh, existent here, but you know, not really noticeable when you're shown very briefly. Okay, and then when we did this, again we're using a, a information theoretic or signal detection measure, then we found that uh, in this particular image. Uh, case, uh, we found uh, 0 0.74 uh, in terms of AUC. And then if I subtract the baseline of 0 0.5 and then uh, multiply by two to make it you know, perfect performance to be one bit. And then here we actually you know, have a hundred combination of, of all distinct uh, questions and then divided by the presentation duration of one, um, 133 milliseconds to arrive 369 bits per second. And this is just an example, but we we did this uh, similar kind of experiment using the uh, pictures, and the results were pretty much the same. Okay, or even better. And then we are now doing it with uh, 80 questions and also non-repeated uh, absent words to estimate the sort of the lower bound of the information that people can uh, report. And note that you know, as we as I mentioned, by default, all these you know present words and the absent words are uncorrelated empirically according to Cao's uh, uh, experiment. So this you know, performance cannot be uh, explained by the you know, correlation of the words. So now uh, towards the end, uh, I want to uh, link, to the link back to our initial question of how we can actually start to do the information theoretic or mathematical modeling of conscious experience, linking to the information uh, theoretic structure that I introduced in part one. So one way to consider my uh, our experiment is something like this. So reported words are set of the words. And then response options we prepared is like a huge bag of words, like 4,000 words. And then among subset of them, we tested and then we it was endorsed. 
that's a kind of a structure of the response options and the uh, reported words and those words in our experiment. And then we can use, continue to use the set theoretic kind of you know notions, but mapping like uh, reverse version of you know to um, characterize the uh, relationship between the uh, subset of the reported words and those words and their response options is kind of clumsy. It turns out. Uh, however, uh, there is a way to deal with this uh, kind of a situation in the uh, category theory, in uh, particular topos. So here uh, we map the two different kinds of the response, like endorsed and not endorsed, as yes to no, and then we map this into this uh, uh, from top left to bottom left, uh, and then link it with the yes answer, and then we also generate some kind of you know inquiry or uh, so-called terminal object to yes as a sort of the way to extract what's the uh, subset of this in response options that were reported and then endorsed. And this kind of uh, um, notion topos uh, can potentially model our experiment in a nice way and also can uh, potentially also uh, relate our experiment, which is kind of weird experiment to other types of the standard experiment. But what I mean by that is, uh, so here is the sort of the simplified structure of the topos. Uh, subset is included in the all the sets, and then subset goes to one question, and one question has a yes, no, two values. And then the left side is a characterized subset structure that probably reflects some kind of our experience of seeing uh, something embedded in uh, potential experience that we have like this you know huge options and then on the right side is a boolean uh, algebra meaning like asking questions did you see this or not you have two answers and this uh, is quite interesting because uh, i found because this mathematical structure can be uh, adopted for any inquiry as well as the uh, inquiry itself can uh, answer to be uh, to the inquiry can be graded like not only two options, but we have eight options of a level of confidence. And also we can uh, um, replace this uh, one uh, with uh, did you attend or not, or what did you see it consciously or not? And also similarity rating can be also similar to the confidence. Uh, we can uh, capture something like this way. So uh, the topos uh, structure can be a viable option to characterize um, uh, inf uh, information in a uh, phenomenology. And this is, by the way, a, a visual version of this experiment. But using this topos uh, structure, we can consider these two tasks to be completely identical in terms of the information structure. So the part two summary is that the structure of moment of conscious experience is much richer than previously thought. And it's also consistent with uh, some of the IAT's actions. And we are trying to model this phenomenology uh, in a mathematical manner. And then uh, let me take question after going further two slides is it okay yeah that's, that's fine yeah. we've we'll, we'll got a few questions piling up but uh i thought we were so close to okay. the end i thought we'd leave to the end yeah so finally uh how we can now investigate the relationship between this uh structure of information and the phenomenology and uh basically uh the answer is uh the category theory because up uh, once we get to this kind of you know structure information structure in both phenomenology side and the mathematical side or uh, brain side, then linking these would be relatively easy using uh, category theory. I mean, uh, easy in the sense of, you know, uh, theory or in principle. And here's a list uh, that uh, you can take a look uh, by uh, reading the, so the uh, downloading the, uh, my PDF file. And so take a home message is that uh, to understand the fundamental question of uh, physical basis consciousness, I propose that uh, we can uh, characterize the structure of the courier and the information, and then finally link back to the phenomenon and the information using category theory. That's it. Thank you. OK, thank you now. Uh, you won't be out here, everyone else applauding. You might might see some applause coming up on the comments, but uh, <laughs> I'll give you the audible right. feedback. Uh, okay. OK, so we have um, we have at least five minutes for, for questions, and there's a few here. So. Let's have a look. Uh, we've got one vote on on the top three, so let's um, let's see. We can just take them in the order that they're there, I guess. Let's start with the first one from uh, Sebastian. Uh, how do you interpret the cutting of A to B or B to A? Is it just 
computing slash statistical trick or does it have a biological meaning? Okay, so the question is about uh, Sebastian, I'm going to invite you on screen. Yes. I'm going to invite Sebastian on yeah. screen while you're handling it. Go so ahead. Here, uh, the disconnection is uh, statistical, but uh, in principle, it should be uh, uh, the same as a biological disconnection as well. Uh, what I mean is that um, if we know the connect uh, the mechanism of A and uh, AB to be fully characterized by this uh, transition probability matrix, then this connection uh, means uh, noising this you know, connection. So it uh, makes that A state to be, in this case, you know, uh, when you disconnect A to A, A state become random. And that's something that, you know, um, after disconnecting the neurons to inject uh, uh, noise, that's probably a better way to think about that. Okay, I think uh, I'm assuming Sebastian was, was happy with that. So I'm gonna click that one as done. Next one has two votes, so let's take that. Uh, this is from, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll invite Chang Sob on, on screen while we uh, repeat the question. The phrase physical basis in your title indicates physical substrates in the brain. Are there any truly bottom-up approaches trying to understand the emergence of consciousness from physical interactions of neurons? So in a sense, I'm not taking this in you know, a uh, bottom-up approach actually. Um, as an uh, I, I, IAT, uh, for example, is starting from phenomenology side. And then from phenomenology side, it tries to identify what is necessary to achieve this phenomenological property, like you know, inform informativeness or integratedness. And that, in that sense, it's not really truly bottom up, like uh, starting from the thing to uh, eventually arrive at the uh, uh, you know, mind, rather mind, starting from mind and then try to understand what explains mind. I don't know if that is a sufficiently, such a sufficient question, uh, answer to that, but yeah. fine. I think that, sound, that sounds okay. I don't think Chen wanted to come on screen, so we'll leave it there unless he sends okay. a clarification. Uh, the next one that's been upvoted is from uh, Akshay. I'm going to invite, uh, Try to the screen, but uh, feel free to refuse it if you don't want to. The question is: Is there any way uh, that will change in the information structure if we can tweak with the local brain circuitry of the future A B, A comma B, or A hyphen B? Uh, does that make sense? I'm not. I'm trying to parse that sentence. Does that make sense to you? Uh, not really. But uh, to come back to this one. Um. um it, this you know transition probability matrix um, is the sort of the mechanism of the brain. Um, you know when uh, so if A and B's connection or states are changed, uh, the connection or mechanism of uh, A and B to become like you know um, on and off to be changed, then uh, of course TPM will change. And that uh, associated uh, change will lead to the eventual, you know, structure change. And that's basically what we are seeing with this, you know, uh, you know, wake versus anesthetized uh, states. Um, in a sense, wake state uh, generating this in you know, a bigger integrated information structure corresponds to the fact that you know each of the components are influencing each other. And it's not easy to cut the system, noise the system to get the similar distribution in any way. Every time you try to cut, you lose a lot. That's a sort of the wake state, you know, uh, property. But in the case of the anesthetized uh, brain, probably because each of the areas are highly, you know, like, you know, becoming independent or disparate, even though the recording wise, you know, anesthetized the recording is very similar to uh, awake. Um, it's not that, you know, uh, easy to, uh, it's easy to decompose. Okay. Uh, I don't think the invitation on screen worked, so we'll, we'll leave it there unless uh, I try to send a clarification. I clicked unanswered on that one. Um, now, the next question, I actually put a, a clarification on this myself, but I'll, I'll read, I'll invite 
a bit on the screen and I'll start reading the question out. Uh, how different is the causation approach you used to quantify the effect of the past? Uh, maybe I, we probably answered this one, right? In uh, uh, well, it, 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 it seems to be asking about the comparison to the transfer information approach. I assume they mean transfer entropy. Uh, yeah, you, I mean, like that. That? Yeah. you can clarify. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like, yeah, it's transfer entropy. I mean, because because here what you are doing is you are, you are, you are doing some causation. So you are cutting some connection and then seeing that, okay, um, there's, there's a change in the mechanism. So this connection is important. So what if, what's the difference when just trying to measure like uh, some transfer entropy from B to A or A to B and from the future to the past? Like what, what, what's the merit of, of actually uh, doing a causation and cutting here, for example? So I, I invite you to go to that. Uh, can I actually uh, type in to as a response? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can add a comment on there. Uh, so I, I, I suggest uh, you take a look at this, you know, paper uh, uh, with uh, Amari and also uh, Oizumi. Using the information geometry approach, we found that uh, transfer entropy and the integrated information is related, highly related but uh, uh, in an interesting way. So uh, transfer entropy, you can think of it as a sort of the quantifying the causal influence from one node to another, specifically. But integrated information tries to uh, cut the both directions uh, at the same time. And uh, that, that was the sort of the version two of the integrated information. And then today, what I uh, uh, explained was more uh, you know, refine the version by integrated information. And there, this, you know, um, IIT so-called three version, I'm not really sure whether we can uh, make a formal link with uh, 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 um, transfer entropy. But uh, it, it is highly related, yes. Yeah, I put in uh, my clarification to the comment. My understanding from that Oizumi paper is that transfer entropy was a subcomponent uh, of, uh, of of the overall uh, phi uh, at that point. Um, I think uh, just, just to clarify on, on the causal nature, when you're talking about cutting the connections here, it's not a physical cut. Like it's not like you're intervening in the system and making the cut. You're looking at how you could model the system without that um, connection there in the probability distribution function, yeah. right? Like it's still observational, yeah. the same as transfer entropy is, and that's why. Right, so it's like a noisy. Component. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Is that okay, Abed? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay, so I'll take that one off. Now, there's one last question here, which I'll get you to answer while I bring Oliver on the screen. I bet I'll take you off. So Oliver's our next speaker. Uh, the question is, uh, is now suggesting that attention gates conscious experience. Yeah, so the here, I'm, I suggested something like this, oh, attention and consciousness and so on. But uh, if you, I, I also suggest to, um, you know, some of the other my papers uh, on attention and consciousness, uh, the most, the, the easiest entry is probably Koch and uh, Suchia 2007, uh, Trends in Cog Science. But um, there are many other papers to suggest that uh, attention and consciousness are probably different things. And uh, it's not always the case that, you know, attention is always necessarily gates the conscious experience and uh, our experiment for example uh, uh, showed that um, natural scene for example seems to be doing much much easier to report and also you know uh, uh, escape from the attentional you know or expectation kind of a, uh, limit however if you test something like, you know, um, uh, highly artificial and also repeated in nature, like this, you know, letter arrays, then I think it's totally necessary for you to be attentive and only those things that you attend is something that you can report. But uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, it really depends on the type of the um, experience and also the type of the stimuli and also the way you uh, report as well. So among, for example, these uh, types of natural scenes, like animals, like, such as, you know, snakes, or um, gist of the scene, like, you know, uh, 
people, a park or um, insects, flower, all these things are probably not something that is necessary, uh, necessarily depend on that tension. Okay. Uh, thank you now. Uh, yep. I've let you go a bit over time, I just realized. So uh, I'm sorry to everyone, everyone that might keep you a bit into the break. Let's give now, well, I'll, I and Oliver will give now another another clap. And uh, thank you very much now. Oh, largest now. applause. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> more than one. <laughs> I'll tell you what, so if there's any more questions for now, feel free to put them in the Neurostars forum uh, for now to answer.